Good afternoon. I'm Trisha Laughlin Bloom. I'm the Curator of American Art at the Newark Museum of Art. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our launch event, the official launch of Carlos Via Worlds in Collision. We're collaborating today and we're so glad to have you here with us with the Clement Price Institute on Ethnicity, Culture and the Modern Experience and the San Francisco Art Institute and a wonderful group of authors uh, for this panel to celebrate the catalog that goes with the exhibition that we opened here today at the Newark Museum of Art. And we're gonna meet some of the authors and hear from them in just a minute. I first wanna just show you a couple of installation views for those of you who can join us. We are opening our doors wide for you. We can't wait to see you this weekend. Uh, this is the entrance to the exhibition. And um, if you just go to the next slide, please another view of the main gallery. So uh, we're really excited to share with you uh, and thank uh, so many thank yous. We thank our collaborators, the Asian Art Museum, San Francisco Art Institute, and everybody who helped make this happen. Um, just before we introduce our authors, I uh, wanted to introduce someone very important, another wonderful collaborator, Jack Chen. Jack Chen, uh, for those of you who don't know him, is one of the leading scholars of Asian American studies in the field and a seminal figure in the establishment of important academic centers, uh, numerous important academic centers, including the Museum of Chinese in America and the Clement Price Institute for Ethnicity, Culture, and the Modern Experience. So let's welcome Jack. I'm gonna turn it over to you to take us forward with our panel. Thank you, Tricia, and um, thanks to the New York Museum for this fantastic installation. Um, you know, uh, I just wanted to make two quick, two, two quick points. Um, one of them is that uh, if, you, if you know anything about San Francisco's uh, history, you probably have seen photographs or in the, have been in the streets uh, when some of the Chinatown old timers were wearing hats. Um, and of course, it was a generational um, uh, kind of uh, uh, way in which men uh, that were both Chinese and also Filipino, um, actually, when they were in the city, they wore these beautiful hats. And I just wanted to kind of make a tip of the hat um, to all the people involved in producing this incredible book. Um, you'll, it, let me just show you the cover because it's, it's just beautifully done. And um, and beautifully crafted and, and lovingly done. And I just wanted to say that it really takes so many people to establish 
uh, to create this kind of exhibit, but also to create this book. And it really took um, really um, the, the amazing people who are involved uh, in writing this, um, in, in kind of documenting Carlos Villa when he was alive, uh, but also um, pulling together his archives. Uh, there's immense work that's involved. And it's also to say that it's not like it happens automatically. People who are incredibly talented and prolific, um, oftentimes many of them don't get acknowledged, especially people in uh, minoritized communities that are pushed to the margins. Uh, so this is not only an incredible achievement for Filipino American, American studies and art history, but also for Asian American art history. But I think we get caught up in these categories in a way that sometimes um, maybe tends to segregate what this is about, because clearly as made clear in the essays and in the installation, Carlos Villa had an expansive understanding of the interconnection of people. And he worked with a wide range of people when he was in San Francisco, but also in New York. So let me just say, um, thank you so much to Mark Johnson and Tricia uh, Lagosa uh, Goldberg. I mean, just spectacular book and spectacular curated show. Uh, Margo Machida, a longtime friend and colleague. Uh, Tio Gonzalez, thank you for the fantastic book and the great, great work you're doing at the Smithsonian. Uh, Luis Francia, uh, of course, and uh, Lucy Lepard. Uh, there are just so many people who have been involved in making this project possible and their essays are fantastic. And also a shout out to Amalia Mesa Baines, who is a longtime friend, but also someone that appears, her name appears as a collaborator with Carlos Villa. Um, the other thing I just wanna say is that um, here we are on the Atlantic, saltwater coast. And in many ways, Carlos Villa kind of transited between the two, the two oceans. And rather than thinking of the lower 48 and New York versus San Francisco, which is the tendency within a kind of a national framework of art history, it seems to me that Carlos Villa's work really forces us, asks us, and, and invites us, really begs us, but really pushes us, I think, hard to really think of uh, really the more complex global diaspora of, of creation, of creativity and art making, uh, writing, uh, poetry and performance. So in many ways, I think when we have this fantastic exhibit uh, here in the East Coast, uh, also adjacent to um, Black portraitures, uh, play and performance, which is the other exhibit that we're actually opening um, this week uh, as part of the, the Price Institute and the, uh, and the Express Newark work. Um, so I want to make sure that when you're coming to see this incredible show, you're also seeing uh, the three other shows that are connected, one of which is at the Newark Museum as well. And to so say that um, what connects these two salt waters is really uh, kind of a port culture or multiple port cultures. And I really think of, uh, from my historian's point of view, Carlos Villa as being really uh, one of the citizens of the port culture, which is worldly, which is not fancy. You don't have to go to France and speak French um, to, uh, to be a cosmopolitan in this case, but you're someone who has the imagination of the interconnection of the many different worlds that make up a port culture and how it's connected to many other parts of the world. There's also uh, kind of an archipelago kind of, uh, kind of understanding and vision of the world. Uh, of course, uh, Hoofa, uh, 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 Peli Hoofa, excuse me, uh, has talked about the sea of islands in terms of how to understand the Pacific worlds. And I think the same needs to be understood in terms of the Atlantic worlds and the interconnection between all these worlds, uh, especially of folks who have been colonized, right? So in so many ways, his work is about that. So um, I just wanted to welcome everybody, say thank you so much uh, for all of you for doing this work. And I wanted to also introduce um, the two uh, curators for the show, Tricia Lagoso Goldberg. She is an artist, curator, and the former chief of staff at the San Francisco Art Institute. She has Previously, um, she was previously the public uh, project manager for the San Francisco Arts Commission, art in public places manager for the Hawaii State Foundation on Culture and the Arts, uh, 
and executive director of Southern Exposure in San Francisco. And she's worked on many exhibits and projects. I won't list them all, but you'll be able to see them in the, in the catalog. And also I wanted to introduce Mark Dean Johnson, who's a professor of art at San Francisco uh, State University. He previously worked at the San Francisco Art Institute and collaborated with Carlos Villa. Uh, he was principal editor of Asian American Art, a History, 1850 to 1970, and has done many spectacular exhibits. Uh, currently, he's co-editing an online catalog of the work of Martin Wong, which I'm really looking forward to, who, again, also was one of these bi-coastal people, but also I think of someone like Martin Wong and Carlos Villa as both port culture artists and creators. Uh, so uh, welcome you both. Uh, thank you so much for this fantastic exhibit. Thanks so much, Jack. Um, you know, what an absolute joy it is to be here with you all today on this historic occasion um, in honor of our dear friend, mentor and teacher, Carlos Villa, the late Carlos Villa. Um, I'm going to share my slides right now. Bear, bear with me while I, uh, while I run my own media. Can you see that? Yes. All right. Okay, hold on one sec. Oops. Okay, sorry about that. I actually can't see my notes now. <laughs> um, all right, this is this is live. Here we go. Okay. Um, so I want to just get started. Here we go. A uh, project of this scale isn't possible without the support and hard work of many. Uh, first and foremost, we want to acknowledge the University of California Press um, for recognizing the importance of the Carlos Villa Worlds in Collision book project that accompanies the eponymously titled exhibition. I mean, what a beautiful job the editors and designers did to illustrate and amplify Villa's stories and practice. Um, it truly is an honor to share this publication with you today. Next, we offer a deep bow to an individual without whom this project would not have been, would have been flightless and grounded, Sherwin Rio. Sherwin wasn't able to be with us today, um, but Mark and I owe him a great debt as the photo editor for this book project. And more than that, Sherwin was and is the knower and finder of all things Carlos. Uh, he has an impeccable memory and deep knowledge of the artist's studio. And, you know, although Sherwin uh, never worked with Carlos directly, he really is part of a generation of artists who carry the Via torch and legacy. And for this, we are, we are grateful. Um, we also want to recognize Jennifer Welford and Liam Laudia. So they co-organized co the public, pro a public program centered around Carlos Via's iconic Worlds in Collision Symposia series for the Berkeley Art Museum in 2018. Uh, we can thank efforts like theirs for keeping vital conversations around multiculturalism in the arts that VIA helped to launch in the 70s and kept pushing on until his final days in 2013. So many thanks to the sponsors of the Carlos VIA Worlds in Collision exhibition and publication. Um, the list is long and illustrious. Uh, the Henry Luce Foundation, the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the Bernard Osher Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Terra Foundation of American Art, the Carpenter Foundation, and the generosity of private donors. And finally, a big shout out to our collaborators and institutional partners, the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco, um, the San Francisco Art Institute, the San Francisco Arts Commission Galleries, and of course, the Newark Museum and Rutgers University. Thanks so much. So now I'm gonna pass the floor over to Mark Johnson. Um, who will give us an introduction to the book and uh, give us an overview of the illustrious authors um, who are featured in the, in the book and um, some of whom are joining us today. Go ahead, Mark. So thank you, Tricia, and thank you everyone for being on the call. Uh, when we first discussed this project, um, we realized that a lot of Carlos Villa's work was no longer extant. And so the book documents not only works that are in the exhibition, but a number of works that are currently lost. Uh, and those are featured in portfolios. Uh, so it really gives 
an opportunity that gives the reader an opportunity to uh, think more holistically about the artist's work. You can see the list of uh, contributors here, um, many of whom are on the call, but some of those who are not listed in this list include uh, Jennifer Rissler, the Dean of the Art Institute, Jay Shu, uh, who the, is the director of the Asian Art Museum. Uh, but then you see uh, this wonderful group of uh, Patrick Flores, Luis Francia, Theo Gonzalez, Paul Karlstrom, Lucy Lepard, Margot Machida, and Sherwin Rio. I'm just going to ask Tricia to show the next slide and just give you a sense of some of the chapters and the look of Carlos's work from different periods. Uh, on the left is a painting from 1959 that it's such a joy to see in the gallery. We know that in 1958, Carlos asked his teach, one of his teachers uh, to, where he could learn about art of the Philippines and Filipino American art history. And the teacher said, there isn't any. And that led him on a lifelong search. Um, but at the same time, he was warmly embraced as a beat era artist. Carlos as a teacher often gave his students buckets of tar to work with. Looking at this painting on the left, we're going to have it evaluated to see if that black anvil like form is actually one of the tar paintings, which I suspect it is, um, but that scraffito appears in some of Villa's last work. So when you do a retrospective like this, it gives you that window to look early, late and see the cycles of Villa's work. Next slide. Um, an exciting part of the exhibition is to use the collection of the Newark Museum, which in 1967 sponsored an important exhibition of oceanic art that Villa may have seen and is, we think about the roiling forms and some of these objects and in the Bontoc raincoat in the lower right hand corner, the actual form of some of Carlos Villa's coats, it seems like he may have brought these inspirations with him for his entire life. So to think ethnographically, this is the section of the book written by Tricia Lachlan Bloom. Next slide. Margot Machida beautifully delves some of the works that are no longer extant, like the beautiful uh, Sepik River figure on the left and works that we can no longer see, like the work in the collection of, the, of a museum in Havana on the right. Next. And Luis Francia writes about the poetry and thinks about, of Carlos's poetry and thinks about things that I never was aware of, these ladders that Carlos created that are poems suspended as sculpture that relates to the way poems are carved into bamboo in the Philippines um, are just ideas that are stunningly innovative. Next. Um, and then again, the catalog itself shows many of these important objects. In 1990, Carlos returned to the Philippines for the first time or went traveled to the Philippines for the first time and his work started to address the specific sociological history of the Manong, the generation of his parents. Uh, the painting on the left is entitled My Father Walking Up Kearney Street for the First Time, implying his approach through the urban jungle to the ghetto for the Filipino community. Next slide. And we also present a timeline that talks about Carlos's work as an organizer, because in San Francisco, he is beloved as someone who helped shape dialogues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. He used the word multicultural himself. It's sort of the legacy of civil rights and the visual arts. And so many of us connected with Carlos through that organizing, uh, but it's so great to actually see the artwork that he produced at the same time. Next, I'll ask Tricia to speak here. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, there's a lot that can be said about Carlos as a teacher, mentor, and leader in the Bay Area arts community. Those who worked with him, myself included, knew that breakfast meetings before dawn, taking on slightly more work than was comfortable or easy, um, and a readiness to learn from unlikely sources were part and parcel of the worlds in collision methodology. 
One major concept and takeaway from working with Carlos, street scholarship. So the notion that knowledge and profound creative production need not come from the ivory towers of the academy, the authorities, the canon, or the dominant culture. It can come from you, it can come from me, the disenfranchised, the marginalized, those who may seem invisible to many. In addition to celebrating Carlos, we also want to celebrate the community um, he was part of, that he helped to build, and uh, that he was so committed to. So the Mill Order Brides here is an artist group based in uh, San Francisco and LA in the upper left-hand corner with Carlos and Rigo, uh, another artist from um, the San Francisco Bay Area who was active, uh, you know, really part of this community in the 90s, in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, let's see. Uh, oh, we have Mike Arcega and... Um, Oh, so I'm sorry, I lost my place here. So the mail order brides, this is Eliza Barrios, Rihanna Estrada, and Jennifer Wolford, who collaborated with Carlos over the years, and Mike Arcega, um, who studied with Carlos at SFAI, and who was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship alongside VIA in 2012. Um, this image on the lower left-hand side was taken at the opening for the artist's solo exhibition at the Mission Cultural Center, uh, titled Manong's some doors and a bouquet of crates. That's uh, Maurizio Hector Pineda on the far left. It's Kevin Chen, Terry Acebo Davis, Eliza Barrios, Mark Johnson and I, um, I'm holding on to Theo Gonzalez's book, The Integrity of Spaces that was um, released that same evening. So here's to being in a community uh, together and lowering every barrier to learning and making. I'm going to pass the floor over to Mark. We just wanted to recognize that Carlos is an important public intellectual, and he brought so many people together and so many projects were a part of it. It certainly changed the direction of my own professional path uh, and made so many introductions possible. Uh, this is an image in the upper left of Carlos and Margo Machida in New York in 2012. Below that, uh, two scholars who Carlos introduced, Bell Hooks and Amalia Besa Baines, and an example of the kind of work that came out of their friendship. You can see the title is Homegrown, Engaged Cultural Criticism. And then on the right, uh, we acknowledge the passing, not only of Carlos Villa, but Hong Liu, uh, who died recently. Carlos's last trip out of the house was to attend Hong Liu's retrospective at the Oakland Museum five days before he passed. Uh, this is why we are here to celebrate this intellectual history and to make it better known. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Tricia and Mark for that. Um, kind of a, a view of the catalog and also thinking about the exhibition. So I'm Alexandra Chang, and I'm the associate. Uh, I'm an associate professor of practice at Rutgers University Newark for their art history program in the art, culture, and media department. And I'm also interim associate director over at the Price Institute with Jack. Um, and thank you, Jack, for those wonderful comments. And um, I'm also associate director of the American Studies program there. Um, I wanted to quickly thank also. Um, uh, both the Price Institute and the museum um, for my, inviting me to be a part of this and also my class. And also for um, the Bard Center for Curatorial Studies um, for all of their support uh, for this program, this really important program and um, allowing my uh, collaborative class at Bard for Asian American and Asian diasporic art and visual cultures and my Global Asia's class with um, art and visual cultures with Rutgers um, to also be a part of this. They're in the audience now. We just taught a bit about uh, the catalog and Carlos Villas. I'm so excited to have these speakers here today that will be joining us for the panel. So uh, the panelists that we do have um, here are going to be uh, Margo Machida, um, eminent scholar um, and curator and um, scholar, uh, writer, uh, Luis H. Fancia, and also um, scholar curator, <laughs> um, Theo um, Gonsalves. And so I'm gonna um, 
introduce uh, each of these um, scholars uh, and, and contributors to the catalog um, and uh, before they speak, and then they're going to speak a little bit about uh, their contributions to the catalog. And then we'll have a discussion together in which we hope that you will ask questions and uh, we'll be able to you know, answer them as well. So um, I would like to introduce first Marga Machida. So Marga Machida is a uh, a professor, a professor emerita of art history and Asian American studies at the University of Connecticut. Born and raised in Hawaii, she is a scholar, independent curator, and cultural critic, specializing in Asian American art and visual culture. She has lectured widely on her research nationally and internationally, and she served as the cura curatorial advisor for the inaugural, inaugural 2017 Honolulu Biennial. Her book, Unsettled Visions, Contemporary Asian American Artists in the Social Imaginary, published by Duke University Press, received the Cultural Studies Award, uh, Book Award from the Association for Amer Asian American Studies. She's also associate editor of Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures and the Americas. And she also uh, received the 2021 College Art Association Excellent, Excellence and Diversity Award um, and is, the co is one of the co-founders of Godzilla, Asian American Art Network. Uh, welcome, Margot. Thank you so much, Alexandra. How wonderful to be here. Um, actually, could I get the first slide up? Because I think it's always good to see the art. Um, okay. Anyway, I'm really honored uh, to join today's virtual book launch, celebrating Carlos Villa's remarkable legacy as an artist as an educator and an activist. His visionary efforts to champion works by artists of color, those anchored in a passionate commitment to Filipino American art and art history, set a benchmark for cultural activism in the arts. This landmark retrospective, Carlos Villa, Worlds in Collision, confers the historic opportunity to advance fresh critical understandings of Via's creative production. And my remarks are going to focus on work from the 70s, the pivotal decade when Via's art making would increasingly engage with his Filipino cultural heritage. While Carlos Via is perhaps best known today as a vocal proponent of multiculturalism, he also embraced an expansive third worldist perspective that linked domestic communities of color to their non-Western counterparts around the world. The global reach of his interests and his transnational approach to art making developed against the Cold War backdrop of post-colonial independence struggles in Africa, Asia, and the Caribbean, the escalating US war in Vietnam, and the momentous rise of the civil rights, identity-based, and counterculture movements of the 60s and 70s. Significantly, Via's open-ended and inclusive worldview anticipated conceptions of polyculturalism that arose in the 90s, in which the planet's populations and cultures were viewed as historically being more fluid and porous than extant national and ethnic mythologies would allow. Via's avid pursuit of such influences via what he termed a dialogue with my own universe, Likewise, the lines with recent discourses on world making and multi centric globalization. Carlos Villa's work from the 70s, that ranges from painting, sculpture, and installation art to live performance, embodies a syncretic sensibility by sampling art and artifacts from multiple sources based on a fundamental recognition that his Filipino cultural heritage was complexly hybridized. Viewing the Philippines as a Pacific Island nation that emerged from the commingling of indigenous, Asian, and Western peoples over centuries of migration, trade, colonialism, and warfare, Via felt free to draw upon these diverse cultural streams to craft a self-stylized creolization of aesthetics. While his attention extended to African and Native American cultures and rituals, Via found particular resonance in the practices of other indigenous Pacific and Oceanic peoples from New Guinea, Indonesia, Australia, New Zealand or Aotearoa and the Hawaiian Islands. 
However, unlike some atavistic search for pre-Western authenticity, Via's affinity for polycultural influences provided a means to symbolically reinvent himself as a Filipino American. Having been born and raised in the US diaspora, Via's extended quest for alternate wellsprings of culture beyond the West also allowed for the recuperation of aspects of a pre-contact ancestral heritage that had remained largely obscured to him. And yet the impetus behind Carlos Villa's selection of ethnographically inflected sources always remained deeply personal, centered in self-articulation and inherently present-oriented. As he declared, quote, I wanted to specifically think about me in the whole world. Via's early 70s visits to the collection of traditional art from Africa, Oceania, and the Americas at San Francisco's De Young Museum therefore proved catalytic. Recognizing these objects' affinities to pre-contact Filipino art, he was fascinated by their physical presence, their formal qualities, and the spiritual power they held for their respective cultures. And yet, although Via drew inspiration from a spectrum of cultural, artistic, and design traditions, he never sought to emulate what his sources meant to the indigenous cultures themselves, but rather he focused on making affective connections via the immediacy or the visceral response that these objects and materials elicited for him. As he attested, quotes, I wanted basically to relate to these works with my own body language. I was seeing African sculpture with nails and knives sticking out. And I was saying, that is exactly how I want my work to feel. At the same time, Via continually engaged in a conscious dialogue with Western modernism, reflecting his art school training during the 60s and the early 70s, or the 50s and the early 60s. Many of Via's painted works incorporated organic elements layered together with acrylic paint pigments and laid down with a gestural energy of abstract expressionism. They included bird feathers, chicken bones, blood, cowrie shells, and human hair and teeth. This innovative approach provided Via with a formal means to synthesize modernism with multiple age-old cultural forms that had existed side by side with those of the West. Driven by a sensate and often haptic focus on the materials themselves, Via's attention was particularly drawn to substances he perceived as endowed with mysterious power, connected to practices and rituals he found emotionally, aesthetically, and culturally sustaining. This includes elements from the Roman Catholicism in which he had been raised. Now, beginning with the dramatic feather encrusted pieces like my roots that we see here, the artist produced layered assemblage like paintings on unstretched canvas. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Uh, thank you. Uh, typically incorporating a signature motif of loop like snaking and coiled forms that loosely echo patterns found on tapa or bark cloth throughout the Pacific region. Prominent among Via's materials are thick tufts and whorls of bird feathers that held a deep sense of mystery and empowering spiritual potency for the artist. Sparked in part by viewing ceremonial regalia like the brilliantly hued native Hawaiian feather capes worn by indigenous royalty. Next slide, please. Surrounded by a spiky feathered border, maturing is among the works that introduced animal blood as a medium. Besides the sacred associations of blood with sacrifice and rebirth in the ritual practices of many cultures, including the Catholic liturgy of the Eucharist. This substance offered the artist a palpable link to his Filipino heritage, eliciting youthful memories of participating in the slaughter of animals for special family meals. Recalling these precedents, Via described the pivotal moment 
when he intuitively mixed acrylics with animal blood as producing his first epiphany. By employing material with intense personal resonance, Villa found a means of directly integrating his own heritage into post-war American modernism. Villa recalled, quotes, I finally did it my way. I may have looked at Jackson Pollock with a sense of awe, but to be able to put blood in there and paint with it made it my own. Meantime, next slide. Okay, next please. Oh no, there we go. <laughs> Paralleling the rise of body and performance art in the 70s, Villa began to enlist his body as a primary, can you go back? Primary locus and medium. A signature motif would emerge. Thank you. As the artist feathered paintings took on the sartorial guise of wearable sculpture via cloak and coat shaped painted objects. The cloak like format in works like Song of the Islands resembles the curved contours of Hawaiian feather cloaks, even as they concurrently invoke Henri Matisse's boldly patterned clerical vestments for a Catholic chapel in France. Next, please. Okay, thank you. Cruciform shaped feathered objects like first coat extended the series into long overcoat like garments, partly inspired by Native American ceremonial robes whose linings are inscribed with pictorial imagery. Via often decorated the, in, the inner lining of these pieces with coiled designs and his painted handprints reminiscent of prehistoric cave and rock art in Europe and Oceania that act as surrogates for the artist's presence. Next coat. Next slide, please. In another spectacular piece entitled Second Coat, the interior of the garment also incorporates Via's own hair, sperm, fingernails, blood, and spit. Next. Next slide, please. Thank you. The capstone of this extraordinarily productive decade was an elaborate outdoor painting performance from 1980 entitled Ritual that was loosely modeled on West African Dogon cosmogony and religious practices. At the outset, V appeared in a resplendent feathered coat and mask. The garment was removed and the artist engaged in a ritual-like ritual -like actions that one observer compared to a, quotes, mythic harvesting and divination ceremony. Next slide. Okay. Next slide, please. Thank you. Um, smeared in wet paint and blood, and repeatedly prostrating himself to transfer imprints from his nude body to the canvas. Via's performance can be seen as a self-ceremony staged to metaphorically mark the process of his rebirth as a Filipino-American artist. Thank you. Thank you so much, Margo, for that. Um, and we'll have to talk more about um, that work. It's just fantastic to be able to see. Um, so I believe, um, is Luis, uh, Luis, are you able to um, come on presently? I just wanted to double check because um, I know he's having a little bit of tech trouble. So I think um, actually we might be at first going to um, Theo Gonzalez. So, um, and then we'll, we'll um, uh, return to uh, Luis after that. So um, just to introduce uh, Theo Theodora Gonsalves is the um, interim director of the Smithsonian Asian, Amer Asian Pacific American Center and is the curator at the Smithsonian's National Museum of American History. 
is a Ful Fulbright Scholar and has been a senior fellow at the Smithsonian, the Library of Congress in UNC Chapel Hill. He's a scholar of comparative cultural studies whose research specialties include Asian Pacific American history and culture and the performing arts. Um, he has taught in the US, Spain and the Philippines and he's, he served as the 21st president of the Association for Asian American Studies. He's the recipient of numerous awards and, uh, for um, numerous publications. And he's also um, a member of the editorial boards for American Quarterly and Amerasia Journal. He is a founding editorial member of Elon Journal for Philippinex American and Diasporic Studies. Welcome. Thank you, Alexandra. Uh, first of all, it's, it, I'd like to thank the organizers of this gathering and especially thank you, Randy, for helping out with the technical details. I wish I could be with all of you in person as we celebrate the work of this important artist and educator. Uh, Randy, if we could have that first slide, please. Thank you. I'll just spend a few minutes with you to highlight some of the elements from the essay that I contributed to the catalog, which was beautifully edited by Mark Dean Johnson and Tricia Lagasso Goldberg. I titled my essay, fake book uh, to signal the book of unauthorized arrangements and sheet music that professional musicians and students carry with them to gigs and to school. For me, the fake book is a kind of a shorthand for the repertoires that you've mastered or you want to master or you simply want to have within easy reach. And in this way, I want to focus on the expressive forms of culture that embroider my understanding of Carlos's context. I love that Burchard's photo of Carlos uh, shooting pool faces my essay, the beginning of the essay. I have no idea if Carlos was any good at billiards, but he certainly looked like he was a pro. And that's at the heart of uh, the essay as I started to write it. I believe that this was an, an opportunity to be able to link biography with context, repertoire to archive, and cultural style to individual statements. Let's go to the next slide, Randy. In this next slide, we see a photo of Carlos's father, Pedro. And this was also the subject of some of his other work um, from many years ago. Scholars of Asian American and Filipino American histories will point out that it was quite common for US nationals like Pedro to take photos in front of cars that weren't their own and to pose in suits that they may have borrowed. The point here was to tell all of these little white lies um, about America to the family back home. All is well here in the States, supposedly, even though life during the repression was nasty, brutish, and short. We have to ask if the smile of Pedro's was sincere or was it a put on? It might've been the jazz age for others, but for Filipinos in California in the 1920s and 1930s, you'll have to turn to works like Carlos Bolosan's America's in the Heart to bear witness to the descent into madness that many of this generation experienced. Carlos Villa, talked himself often about this generation, his father's generation and his mother's generation and their experience with self-loathing, as well as attempts to hold on to one's dignity. Let's go to the next slide. I opened the essay with an epigraph from Luis Valdez's 1978 play, Zoot Suit. And this was turned eventually into a musical film in 1981. The epigraph reads, Pachuco, the ideal of the original Chuko was to look like a diamond, to look sharp, hip, bonnaroo, finding a style of urban survival in the rural skirts and outskirts of the brown metropolis of Los Gabron. The press's response, it's an affront to good taste. The Pachuco replies, like the Mexicans, Filipinos and blacks who wear them. So what fascinates me about this quote is how there's actually a link between Luis Valdez and Carlos Villa Luis Valdez was born four years after Carlos, and as the son of immigrants, he also looked back to the styles of his parents' generation. He found defiance and dignity in, in their stance, and I believe that there's a deep cultural correspondence going on in Carlos Villa's attitude as well. Let's go to the next slide. In the essay, I mentioned the 1972 documentary by Japanese-American filmmaker Dwayne Kubo, um, and that documentary is called Cruise in J-Town which was a look inside the cultural work of the Asian American movement anchored in Los Angeles's little Tokyo. So in this slide, in this image here, we actually have Daniel Valdez, the brother of Luis, who's talking with Dan Kuramoto, who was a member of the band Hiroshima. They're having a conversation about the meaning of this term called rasquache. The conversation is loose and it's playful 
And Daniel tries to sum up what this term means for Chicano cultural expression. He just calls it funk. Carlos Villa, though, he finds deep cultural correspondence with that term rascuache, and here's how he understood it. Quote, rascuache is to be able to take a t-shirt that my father bought for me and to be able to bleach it snow white, whiter than white, and to be able to put creases on the shoulders and for it to have the right folds, right on the cuff, and to be able to look in the mirror and say, hey man, this is me, unquote. In other words, taking a humble undershirt and making it sharp like a diamond. Next slide, please. Finally, if you wanna see a minor example of this rascuache element in play, I'll close with a photo taken by a Filipino American artist, a fellow artist by the name of, by the name of uh, Ricardo Alvarado, who lived from 1914 to 1976, also in San Francisco. This is the interior of a kitchen at Letterman Army Medical Hospital. And you'll notice that the rest of the fellows in the background are wearing their toques on their heads in the usual manner, which is the front part of the hat down midway onto your forehead. The exception here is that young Pinoy chap up front with his toque placed at a rakish angle. His hair may end up in your soup, but he looks like a pro, doesn't he? One way to understand what this young Pinoy chef is doing is to see how rational processes of capital are bent into oblique forms of resistance. It's that historian by the name of Robin Kelly who asks us to look for the clues in everyday work culture. It's a way to turn your body and your clothing, and in the case of Carlos, throughout his entire career, your art making into instruments of pleasure and connection and exploration. Carlos leaves behind, and we can close with the slides here, Randy, thank you. Carlos leaves behind a body of work that has deep cultural correspondences and solidarities with Latino, indigenous, African, Oceanic, and Filipino people. I can't tell you how fun it was in this essay to explore Carlos's fake book, his repertoire of arrangements and favorites, sharp as a diamond, finding a style of urban survival. Thank you. Thank you so much, Theo, that, that was fantastic. Um, and um, I'm really happy to say that Luis has been able to join us. So I'd like to introduce Luis H. Francia, um, uh, a Manuelenio and now New Yorker. Luis H. Francia is a poet, playwright and nonfiction writer. His first full length play, The Strange Case of the Citizen de la Cruz has its, had its world premiere at the um, Bindlestift Theater San Francisco in 2012. In 2014, The Beauty of Ghosts, a theater of poetry, was staged at Topaz in Queens, Topaz Arts in Queens. And in April of 2021, his Black Henry on Ferdinand Magellan's 1521 ill-fated landfall in the Philippines was virtually staged by the Atlantic Pacific Theater Group and produced by NYU's King Wong Carlos Center. Um, his latest poetry collection is Thorn Glass, uh, Thorn Grass, sorry, uh, published in 2021 by the University of Philippines Press. And um, he, his nonfiction works includes the memoir, Eye of the Fish, a personal archipelago, winner of both the 2002 Penn Open Book Award and 2002 Asian American Writers Award, um, and um, a history of the Philippines from Indios Bravos to Filipinos. Um, and he also teaches Filipino language and culture at NYU's Department of Social and Cultural Analysis. Welcome, Luis. Thank you, uh, Alexandra. You can hear me, right? Uh, sorry for the um, tech issues. Uh, I wasn't expecting the tech issues to come up at NYU, but there you go. At any rate, I'm very glad and honored to be on the panel and to be part of the celebration of Carlos Villas' art and life through this wonderful retrospective of the New York Museum. Congratulations to everyone, to the curators particularly, and to all those who helped put the show together. <clears throat> There's quite a bit of what I'd like to say about Carlos's work, but I'll limit my remarks to how he approached multiculturalism and what it meant to him, not only as a citizen of this country with roots in the Philippines, but as a global citizen. <clears throat> he once said that, most people think that, quote, 
whenever we discuss multicultural issues, it is just about colored people's stuff. But what we discuss does not include all people as if we don't all live on the same planet. For Carlos, multiculturalism was not a product, a brand to be appropriated and displayed, a set of fashion, fashionable accoutrements to indicate that he was cool. Rather, it was who he was. To be multicultural was to be himself. <clears throat> and to be himself made him cool and resulted in the artworks now on display at the museum. Multiculturalism was his wide road to the interior, to paraphrase the haiku master Basho. It was to discover what he had inside of him and in the communal life of a Filipino American, surrounded by family and kin, and especially the Manon, the vuncular, kindly pioneers of the Philippine X diaspora in the United States. It was to examine the layers of a colonial history that not only brought his parents to these shores, but that they carried with them in a literal interpretation of diaspora. Maybe the only advantage of a subject whose historical, social, and political context is suffused with the ghosts of colonialism is to have multiple identities rolled into one, kind of like an earthly trinity. Thus, Carlos' sole trip to the Philippines and to his parents' region is an eye-opener. He hears a multifaceted language, Tagalog, Ilocano, English, Spanish, Chinese, all cohabiting peacefully. He loved these, quote, border crossings, close quote, the creolization that was involved. For of his work, he said, I've always striven for a gumbo, for a creolization of aesthetics in my own work, close quote. A mixture of different culinary cultures, gumbo has its Filipino counterpart in halo halo, which literally means mix mix, the favorite Filipino dessert, and which consists of preserved fruit, beans, coconut spore or macapano, custard, crushed ice, topped with a scoop of ube ice cream and with a pour of evaporated milk. This confection served in a tall glass is mixed thoroughly, thus the word halo halo, before being consumed. The commingled flavors give rise to a distinct delicious hybrid taste. Thus by virtue of their halo halo history, Filipinos and Filipino Americans are instinctively multicultural it is a natural condition. They just need to let it play out, which is exactly what Carlos did, what he had done all along as a Filipino American artist, whether at home or as part of the largely immigrant multicultural milieu of San Francisco. And so in his art, it was only natural that he crossed borders all the time. And one of those borders he crosses over is into poetry. One poetic form that particularly appealed to him was the pantum of Malaysian origin. And basically what the pantum does is to rely on a repetition of certain words and phrases so that the meaning gradually shifts with each iteration revealing a new dimension but one organically springing from what came before, creating both a circularity and an open-endedness that is a pretty good definition of Villiers' sense of multiculturalism. And his explorations bring about unexpected affinities and resonances. Take Campo Santo. When I first saw photographs of the Campo Santo installation with its inscribed brass plates in the middle of a forest, I was reminded of the Ambahan, a traditional Philippine poetic form inscribed on bamboo, whether slats or in actual groves. A centuries old poetic form still in use by an indigenous population, the Hanuno Mangyan on the Philippine island of Mindoro and traditionally sung 
the Amban has seven syllable lines. And according to the Mangyan Heritage Center website, quote, its purpose is to express in an allegorical way, liberally using poetic language, certain situations or certain characteristics referred to by the one reciting, reciting the poem, close quote. Slide, please. Here we see uh, the brass plates and the inscriptions. Um, and it, I don't know if uh, Carlos was aware of the tradition among the Hanuno Mangyan, but let's go to the next slide. We see here the uh, poems seven syllables each. I don't know how to read this. It's a, a language called Baibayin, which is the ancient script before the arrival of the West. <clears throat> but we see this resonances. And <clears throat> when I asked the director of the website whether this tradition continued, she did say that some of the Han Hanuno Mangyan still inscribe both on bamboo plants and bamboo slats, uh, poetic um, uh, thoughts and medita meditations. Uh, we can dispense with the slide, thank you. <clears throat> Via, <clears throat> Via may or may not have been aware of the Amban, but I have no doubt he would have loved it. One could conjecture that Villa's inscription on brass plates sprung from some deep ancestral memory. The poetics of multiculturalism was essentially Carlos's way of seeing himself, what he was and how he came to be and the milieu he grew up in. And he situates his multiculturalism in the America, in an America that is expansive, inclusive, the America of Walt Whitman, where each one of us if we would only open our eyes and hearts, contains multitudes. It is an imagined community that decades earlier, Manon Carlos Bulosan in his classic, America is in the Heart, realizes despite the racism and brutal violence that he and his fellow Manon experienced is attainable only if we all, black, brown, white, yellow, red, pitch in. For Carlos Bolosan, writing was his key to that America. And for Carlos Villa, art was his key to unlocking the door to the America of E pluribus unum, out of the many, one. Thank you, Salamat. Thank you so much, Luis, and, and all of the panelists. Um, I'd like to take this moment um, to bring all the panelists back um, so they can have a Q&A and discussion with the audience. And also um, curators, Mark Johnson, Trisha Lagasago, if you wouldn't mind joining as well, because um, I'm sure folks have questions as well. And um, if you do have questions, please put them in the Q&A um, and we can answer them. I did notice there was a hand Eileen, I believe, and I just, I don't know if you're still here or you still have your question, um, because of course we would love to engage with it if, if you do. Um, so I'm just gonna check if there are any questions presently. Um, there's one about signing, uh, if, if they can get a copy of the book at the New York Museum of Art that's signed. <laughs> so maybe if uh, folks wanna sign some books, right, <laughs> for the museum. Um, so I, I might just ask a few questions as well. And I'd also love for my students to ask questions because we did come up with questions and I do have some of them here, but if they wanted to ask them too, that would be wonderful. Um, so one thing that um, we heard so much about, I mean, this, this, this exhibition is, is, is so important and, and, and that, it, that it happened um, and that it happened now is interesting, right? Because um, like why, why didn't it happen before? Um, how much, you know, the work that we know you put in to have actually um, uh, the, this wonderful survey exhibition to happen and also this catalog to happen, um, you know, it, 
it speaks a lot in terms of, you know, um, thinking about, um, you know, the inclusion of, you know, Filipino American artists within, you know, this larger canon, which, you know, uh, 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 Carlo was engaging with so early on. Um, so it's so important to have this um, exhibition now, and it almost like makes it a, a great statement. But um, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, that um, process and like thinking about why, you know, it would happen now, because I think there's a moment now that's very interesting. And through that, I would love to talk a little bit more about the idea of multiculturalism and um, thinking about um, that in relation to art. Um, so I don't know if Trisha and Mark, if you wanted to talk a little bit or, or, uh, or Margo. Um. No, I defer to the curators. <laughs> okay, I'd be happy to talk about why the exhibition is happening now. And it's happening now because first and foremost, uh, in 2017, uh, a bunch of Carlos's work was rediscovered that was stored mm -hmm. in an attic crawl space uh, four years after his death. And uh, when the work was discovered, we uh, arranged to display it at uh, the San Francisco Art Institute's graduate campus. And it became clear that there were uh, a number of masterpieces that had, we didn't know where their location had been. And as the work was up, as we were cataloging it, uh, Gordon Knox, the president of the San Francisco Art Institute at the time said, we should organize an exhibition to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the founding of the school. So the timing of the exhibition first started in 2017 to address that. Mm -hmm. But I have to say, uh, so much has happened since that time. And uh, I think the violence against Asian Americans is another uh, incredibly important thing to acknowledge as a backdrop for the current exhibition. Uh, And yeah, thanks, just, Mark. And just, just, just to add to that, um, why now? I think it's a great question. Uh, I, I do want to uh, go back to some comments I made earlier uh, to, to talk about the work of, you know, Jennifer Welford and um, Leanne Ladia to organize the day-long symposium, uh, the Carlos Villa Worlds in Collision uh, conversation in 2018 for BAM PFA. Um, I, I also want to mention that uh, you know, Jennifer Wilford has continued to teach the Worlds in Collision curriculum mm -hmm. and to uh, teach Carlos's work in her um, in her art courses at USF, uh, where she's an adjunct professor. Uh, so, you know, I really think that there's a network of artists and, uh, you know, we refer to them uh, lightheartedly as Carlos, Carlos Acolytes. You know, we, we carry the torch. We are of the school of Carlos Villa, um, you know, many of us were introduced to each other um, as a community um, of Asian American scholars, artists, makers, thinkers um, by Carlos. Um, and that's true, you know, of uh, my work with Theo and the Mail Order Brides, um, Paul Pfeiffer, absolutely. I was introduced to these um, individuals through the Worlds in Collision work that I did with Carlos um, in the late 90s into the early 2000s. So um, I think you know there there have been these uh, significant players in his um, in his world that uh, have you know never let the torch die out and have been carrying forward his legacy in these different small um, kind of gestures and small ways and big ones too right so I think that's one thing to note and another you know I think absolutely what Mark is saying a lot's happened since uh, 2017 when these works were found. In our world, a lot's a lot's happened, but I also think that, you know, uh, the worlds in collision work was uh, centered around multiculturalism in the arts, and you know that kind of vital and charged conversation that Carlos was interested in in building uh, discourse around from the '70s into to the day he died, really, right? So that was something he was really committed to, and now we have a different language, so we talk about it as you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion work that we're doing. And I think it's a, a, a real moment, you know, after the George Floyd um, murder and the Black Lives Matter summer, you know, that we all experienced together in the pandemic and in one way or another, um, that this is this is the moment, you know, that Carlos has been, uh, have been 
pushing on these issues of inclusion, of invisibility, of uh, amplifying stories of the marginalized for decades. So I, I think it has a new kind of found meaning and context um, that I certainly feel is so fresh, you know, fresh as fresh today as it was when I first encountered him and, and this approach to thinking about, um, you know, world building and, and the, the art world, you know, as a discrete kind of, uh, you know, system unto its uh, constellation of planets unto itself, right? Um, so I think that's another reason uh, why now. And we see, you know, with the Singapore Biennial um, that Leanne Ladia helped to, uh, and P Patrick Flores, of course, you know, uh, Carlos was represented there. Carlos was also represented in the Prospect 5 um, Biennial that just closed recently. Um, so this is really his moment. And I, I, I do think it's because the work is um, so relatable and we, we really understand now more than ever uh, what, it, what it meant for an artist of that time, of, you know, in the 70s, to um, to really have to build an identity from the ground up, but but not not in isolation, absolutely in solidarity with others. Great. I, I wonder if I, I don't know, Mark, if you might be able to comment a little about in terms of multiculturalism that um, Trisha is talking about in kind of like thinking about how that because you, you talk about a polyculturalism within um, yes. Carlos's work um, rather than this idea of multiculturalism. But then, of course, the terminology has changed, right? It's shift and changed throughout uh, the time that, you know, Carlos was initially creating and then the 80s, 90s and, and present. And I wonder if you might take the audience a little bit through that and, and also this idea of polyculturalism. Well, I think first of all, that I'm very much struck by what, and agree with what Trisha is saying about this, this creating a new context. In other words, it's a, new, it's a different moment in which we can revisit and think again about Carlos's work and the implications of multiculturalism, because it is true that he was using those rhetorics, but it was also the rhetorics of the period. And that I think that one of the problems that, that I've noticed that, you know, Alex, you and I have discussed is um, this tendency now in certain quarters of academe to sort of categorically dismiss work that is phrased as multicultural, we're dealing with identity politics as somehow being, you know, not interesting, not of the moment, not speaking to current critiques. Um, and therefore somehow be, it becomes marginalized within certain conversations. And so I think that it's really necessary to revisit that and to problematize uh, sort of a tendency to read work that was done in a certain period, you know, like I'm, I'm talking specifically about the 70s work that, you know, that I was presenting on, but to read it from a presentist perspective, that was, oh, it doesn't have the right language. But if you look more closely at what he was actually doing and saying about that work, um, then you realize that it's a great deal more complicated. But the problem is that people tend to very superficially hear certain frameworks, certain phrasing, and then decide, oh yes, this is all work of, in this uh, kind of a, um, a box and to not look further. And so I think that what is really, I mean, I, you know, as I said, it's a kind of a problem of um, both presentism, you know, like reading work done at a certain moment in terms of the, the kind of critiques that are voguish today, but also a kind of, you know, and not just a historical, but also presentist. And I think both of those kinds of things are a tendency that we really have to be very mindful and critical of, um, because I see it, you know, as part of the discourse, which, you know, what's really interesting in this conversation is just, you know, how there are so many alternate frames, so many, you know, as I think Patricia was saying, you know, like different universes and different, you know, I mean, and I think that's the, incredible strength by the way of this book is that it presents like all these like different vantage points for looking again on Carlos's work and no single vantage point necessarily dominates and so the the what it does is that it opens out the conversation again um, so it's both an introduction for those that don't know his work but also ways to read it you know from so many I mean, those I was loving 
listening to Luis, you know, listening to Theo. Um, and also, I was so struck by what Luis was saying when he said that to be multicultural was to be himself. You know, like that is a, a different phrasing of the notion of multiculturalism that, you know, I, I think is so instructive. Luis, thank you so much for that. I mean, it, you know, it made me think of um, something that Okwe and Wazor, the Nigerian, the late Nigerian curator said uh, when he was talking about unlearning the notion that ethnography, which is another thing that Carlos's work in the 70s deals with, the notion that ethnography is necessarily bad because there's this kind of censoriousness around this. It's like, you know, if you're working with material from other cultures, you know, that you yourself are plundering them or you're, you know, being neo-colonial or whatever. And, you know, a lot of that language, I mean, he's saying that I, in ways that really, you know, kind of cautioned us to be very careful about just buying into those kind of critiques. And instead he called for what he was calling an ethnographic poetics. And I think that is so much in line, so resonant with what Carlos is talking about. In so many ways, I mean, the things that Carlos brought forward were prefiguring that conversation. And so, you know, th that's just some of my initial thoughts about it. But, but I really so, so appreciate being able to be part of this conversation and, and what this book is able to do. You know, thank you so much, you know, to Mark and to Tricia and to everybody who, you know, has, has really broadened out, really created this multifaceted space. Absolutely. Thank you, Margo, for those comments. I mean, and I would love to like think about um, it together, like uh, about Carlos and how he is so many different things, right? But he's an artist, he's a organizer, he's a, you know, uh, curator, right? Um, he's an educator. Um, and how during this time also, you know, uh, perhaps that's something that had to be done, like uh, talking to other artists, uh, organizers, that, you know, there's uh, the, the extra work that needed to be done and was taken on by um, artists themselves. Now, I wonder if you might talk a little bit about like the multiple uh, kind of roles that he had to take on or he did take on, right? Um, a little bit in terms of like being a part of that move to push things forward, right? Mm -hmm. I don't know, um, Theo, um, would you like to? Um, sure, uh, that's a great question. I think, you know, the for Carlos, the work was never done. And, and Tricia was right when she mentioned that that Carlos didn't hesitate to wake you up for a, <laughs> a breakfast meeting. And it's one of the things that I miss about him the most. Uh, he was uh, tireless in that he always was on one project to the, to the next, not just um, in terms of making his own artwork, but also teaching and, and also mentoring others and connecting people. The Worlds in Collision series, the, the symposia that he crafted is an excellent example of the kind of work that you're talking about, Alexandra, where he went beyond his own work to really become an interlocutor, to be the person who sits between the others as they continue the dialogue. I, I think if, if folks want to pick up that that book, um, uh, the Worlds in Collision Symposia, it is a it's a fantastic uh, document um, that speaks to art making in the 1990s, especially in the Bay Area. But the luminaries that are involved are just really outstanding, and they're trying to get at it from a number of different ways, not just how to how to be able to make artwork in a studio, but also how to find funding, how to how to think about what what funding was like in these precarious times. Uh, of scarcity in the 1980s, moving into the 1990s. Uh, I think folks would benefit from thinking about his curatorial practice in 1976 in the Other Sources exhibit. Um, and I, I want people to notice how that was a, a proper counterpoint to what was going on with the celebratory nature of the bicentennial that was taking place mm -hmm. throughout the nation. There's a, a, a way of, of patting oneself on the back in terms of a nation, in, in terms of its narrative. And Carlos and the other sources was actively directing people to look to the other sources where people were declaring their own sense of independence. Um, not just the other sources materially in terms of what you can put onto the canvas, but the other sources in terms of the traditions. Um, I think there are two, for your students, I think there are two uh, e um, um, examples of an ethos for Carlos that I hope that, that can be communicated. And, and one is that he was a very hard headed person, which is a Filipino American tradition. It's a Filipino tradition. Uh, Luis knows this well as someone who is a hard-headed writer in his own right. 
Uh, notice what happens when an art teacher, his art teacher, Walter Kuhlman says, there is no such thing as a Filipino American art history. Now you could be a dejected student and just turn to Japanese art, Indonesian art, Chinese art, and, and have your career in that way. He does the hard headed thing and looks to other sources to see, are there indigenous traces? Are there, are there, what does it mean to be Filipino as an indigenous person? What does it mean to be Filipino as an immigrant, as a migrant, as a US colonial? He tried to find those sources and, and it's, it's good to be hard headed in that way because he helped to inspire other people to look for their other sources. In 1905, there was a book written by Stanley Riggs commenting on Filipino American literature. Stanley Riggs said, Riggs said in 1905, there is no such thing as Filipino literature. Imagine if Luis Francia and his ancestors would, uh, would have took, taken that advice. Um, if, if Luis were in Riggs's presence, uh, he, would have, he would have had uh, some serious words. He would have had serious words and looked at him in more than just a cross way. We need the hard-headed nature of what it means to refuse how the academy has refused to look at Filipino cultures. Why do we not know enough about Filipinos in art history? It has to do with the training that has been promulgated throughout the academy. Why is it that we know more about some cultures rather than others? And if we don't have people like Luis Francia as the artist, we don't have people like Carlos V as the artist who take the hard-headed nature to say, I'm going to do this work. Um, then uh, we, we will all be uh, 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 for the worse. The other ethos I think that's important for your students to, to under, understand is that is in addition to being hard-headed, you have to find a sense of what it means to be connected to people, to mm. find deep connections, to cook for people, to be in each other's company, to share meals with them um, and, and, to, and to revel in their company. He had a beautiful sense of humor and he loved life and music um, and originally that was what the, what my essay was attempting to, to deal with was, um, uh, our conversations really about music. Um, and so if you're asking your students, what does it mean to, to consider these questions of multiculturalism? I don't know if anyone really wants to consider that. Have people consider what it means to be connected to other people, have people connected to each other through their rituals. So that way the, the times in their life mean something it, uh, from birth to death, them, they're, the, the points in their life are marked with ritual. You notice how Carlos did that so beautifully. Mm. Um, the, the, the vocabulary was used, yes, because it, was, it had to be, something had to refer to what is it that we're talking about. Uh, Margot is pointing us to this notion of, of polyculturalism, which you know, we inherit from Robin Kelly and, and BJ Prashad and, and uh, Abby Lincoln's uh, beautiful uh, album. I've got people in me. That's what that means to be polycultural. Does it mean anything more than that? I hope we don't get hung up on the jargon. Carlos was not a jargony person. He was, he was committed to each other personally. He was also hard-headed. Those are two great characteristics I think you should take forward in learning about Carlos's work. Thank you so much. I, if I may, if I may yeah. jump in. Um, basically, what and that was a wonderful uh, disquisition, Theo. Um, and what Carlos was undergoing was actually what a lot of us were going undergoing in the Philippines in the educational system because having being a colony, being a neo colony, and having been a colony, the educational system in the states was replicated in the Philippines. So the whole process of rediscovering the indigenous self buried beneath the colonial self was something that Filipino artists were undergoing and are still undergoing. Uh, in the Philippines. So there are these two parallel journeys that Carlos was taking and the artists, particularly in the region that he visited, the Cordilleras. There's the Baguio Arts Movement, mm -hmm. where the whole intent was to bring all these artists who were working, creating as a community. And they formed what was known as the Baguio Artists Guild. And they would hold festivals um, and bring in people to work on murals. And it was wonderful. I mean, I knew some of those artists and it's too bad that Carlos never re returned because I think he would have hit it off and they would have had a lot of drinking sessions, bad puns and listened to music. So what he was doing was in a way what we were doing in the Philippines because, you know, when we were in university, there is very little 
indigenous literature that we were given to read. It was all the Western canon. You know, I knew more about Keats and Shelley and Faulkner and Hemingway than I did about Dia and Rizal and Enviam Gonzalez. It was only when I came here that I began to realize there was this whole world that we had been excluded from deliberately, you know. And so when I look at Carlos's work, you know, I, I get the sense that somebody said of a really good poem, you never finish it, you just abandon it. And Carlos's works, they're beautiful, but they always point to something else. In that sense, he abandons the works because it reaches a certain stage and it's on to the next. Yeah, you know, it's a journey. And so there's something very literary about his works. And maybe that's because I'm a writer, but I certainly see that. But it's more than that, of course. Wonderful. I mean, the sense that we also get um, from Carlos from reading um, your uh, the catalogs um, contributions is also just like the dynamic milieu that he was in. And so I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about that, because it seems like, I mean, he, he is himself a musician and a writer and an artist, but also, you know, what was that interaction, uh, you know, both in San Francisco and New York um, were, were there, uh, you know, was he hanging out with, you know, different communities of, of poets and also jazz musicians as well as artists? Um, what, was, what was that like? Well, if I could uh, pitch in here real quick, um, uh, one thing that that is helpful for understanding the life of Carlos is, um, is, uh, is being able to understand the, the Filipino American community within the San Francisco Bay Area. It is unique in a number of different ways, not just for the size of its population, but also for the large number of families that engaged in, in the arts. Um, the Villa family was one of them. The Valador family was another, the Cachaparros, the uh, Ingojos. I mean, for, for generations, there have been families, Filipino-American families, who also did the hard-headed thing as well. I mean, I, I think there are, are children of the diaspora, immigrant children who probably look up to their parents and are wondering, well, aren't we entitled to the same versions of the American dream? Um, and, and is it always going to be tied to the harshest of conditions that, that the first generation experiences? And the hardest-headed of those become dancers and poets and writers. Um, and if you're coming up through the Bay Area in the 1950s and 60s, that political that artistic activity is going to find some way to amplify the political activity, which was also taking place among Filipino Americans as labor organizers and later as, as people involved in social movements. Um, the San Francisco strike uh, in 1968 being one, the, the organizing around affordable housing at the I Hotel. So in, in that San Francisco Bay Area, Carlos becomes part of a Filipino American community that is embedded, that has embedded art with politics. And in that sense, it's really quite a, a, a profound and deep mix. He wasn't a, a copycat of, of others around him. He stood apart, but also stood with many others in that time period. And I, I think um, that, that kind of work, that assessment of Filipino American cultural life has really yet to be written. And, and I think a proper genealogy of the of the, the various tributaries of, of what all that means. Um, that, you know, Tricia and, and Mark have, have put up uh, photos of different people who've been part of that scene for many, many decades. Um, that's, that's still yet to find a proper accounting. Um, and, and again, who's gonna be able to do that? Are folks trained in art history to be able to provide that kind of historical context? Or are we gonna, we gonna have to piece it together in another interdisciplinary, another hard headed ways and it's going to have to come from outside. Maybe it's going to have to come from outside of the, the, the disciplines that we've relied on. Um, that's why he embraced the notion of street scholarship. There were people who knew quite a lot uh, in and outside of the academy. Um, uh, I, I, we want to say that he was also welcome. Um, he, he welcomed those voices in and outside of the academy, but um, um, it, he was always someone who could, who could make those connections uh, across those kinds of disciplines. I, I would say that that's, that's probably going to be key to understanding uh, his context is that San Francisco Bay Area. Thank you. Um, I wonder, um, in thinking about this, um, uh, and Tricia, also um, the idea of worlds in collision in terms of like, um, I, I'm, I'm looking also at uh, one of these questions that we have in the Q&A. Um, how has his influence in his work 
um, been impactful, um, you know, in the past, but then also like uh, presently, like um, there's uh, the question is, um, wondering if there is the same impact as it used to have, but also I was I was wondering about you know because you've really experienced the world in collisions, the teachings, and like um, how you would see or envision it having impact now, right? Yeah, I think that's a it's an interesting question. I was thinking about that. Um, it, I think uh, 1976 was a completely different moment in time historically. Um, you know, we were, Mark and I were giving a tour earlier and um, thinking about this, this, this moment when Carlos made a decision to move from New York, where he was from 64 to 69, back to the Bay Area in 1969. And if we think about what was happening at that time, you know, the uh, emergence of this solidarity and conversation between these um, uh, public universities at Cal, at UC Berkeley, and San Francisco State University, you know, along the Third World Liberation Front um, uh, set of values to create um, an ethnic uh, studies department um, as one example of, um, you know, these are values and interests that Carlos shared. That was a moment. It was a moment when the Black Panther Party was, um, you know, really active in the Bay Area. They had great presence. Carlos was looking at that from New York from a distance and saying, hey, I wanna get down with that. That's you know where it's at. I need to get back to my hometown to, um, and, and, and he did do. So he, he made, it, made it back to the Bay Area in 69 and immediately started working in the community. So he started working at the Tenderloin at a, at a youth center there, right? Making connections with young people. So what does it look like today to experience his work? I think it's a very different context, but at the same time, you know, uh, the, you know, there are still incredible um, community, how do you say, like, you know, I've lived in Hawaii for a long time. I'm from Hawaii, and I, I kind of split my time between uh, Oahu and San Francisco in the Bay Area, and there's no other Filipino-American community like the Bay Area. Sorry, hands down. I know LA, you all try. Uh, shout out New York for, you know, we know, we love, we have big love for all of our cities, but um, Bay Area has just got the vibe, you know, and so, you know, I think like there's a context, even there's a regional context, I think that like experiencing Carlos's energy and his, you know, great gift of organizing individuals, um, and there are still these collectives, um, you know, I think about, you know, also the fact that Carlos never siloed, and he wasn't just a singular, uh, it wasn't just Carlos, it was like, you know, in the Bay Area, I, I was down with Bindle Stiff, you know, when I was doing work with Carlos, you know, you're doing work with dancers. Well, how do we bring the musicians in? We're all working together. So I don't think that there is a real difference. Like, and I really learned that from, from Carlos modeling that for sure, as a curator, as a uh, community organizer, activist, teacher, you know, like we don't need to, there's, it's completely artificial to silo these different uh, media and uh, practices, right? So um, so that's that's some of what I what I have to think. I think the Bay Area is a is a place where um, you know kind of you know Carlos was also like one of the first hyphen hyphen artists that I had met. You know, like he's an artist hyphen teacher hyphen educator hyphen activist. Like I, I'm still all about that. So when I work with you know like the next generation of artists, um, I'm I'm really continuing that uh, value system and saying you don't have to choose. You know, you shouldn't, don't ever fall for it. Somebody tries to tell you, you need to be one thing, absolutely reject that. If you want to be four or five, 10, then um, that's you. That's, you know, we're, we're multiple selves, right? In, in one. So I do think that context um, and the Bay Area is a place that really encourages that kind of, um, you know, poly, uh, I was going to say Amory, polyamory but you know poly kind of like identity like you know multiplicity etc um, a plural plural kind of uh focus um and and just upholding that so i think it's still um it's it's a place where you can you can be more than one thing and carlos really lived that and i think it's still um, practiced today it's definitely relevant and um i wonder if we might just close the panel to think um i don't know if mark you might want to chime in to think about are we going to see more of his work in collections? Because I mean, it's just fantastic the exhibition. It's really exciting, um, and you know, 
thinking about like the importance of um, collecting Asian American art and um, specifically artists like um, Carlos, um, who has had such a big impact and has such a long career that has been so impactful. So uh, the good news is that since the discovery of the paintings in 2017, many of them have found their way into the permanent collections of major museums. Uh, SF MoMA has acquired the major painted cape from 1970-71, and so that's a thrill that it will be well taken care of. Uh, the Asian Art Museum acquired a piece of San Francisco, acquired a piece called First Impressions, which is 70, excuse me, 60 times the artist wiped, put white paint on his face and wiped it and then mounted to have this uh, sort of ghostly uh, collage of uh, 60 self-impressions that he said reminded him of his own mother's face. Mm -hmm. um, there's uh, work in just very recently that's been acquired by the Berkeley Art Museum, by the Oakland Museum of California. So I think the Bay Area is now well aware. Um, there's one piece here from the Whitney Museum, but um, uh, some other work is um, being collected privately in the Philippines, and we hope that uh, work ends up in public collections, uh, you know, across the country and around the world, uh, because he did address global cultures, ancient cultures, contemporary cultures, and so it does have that kind of global resonance. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for being here today to celebrate this wonderful exhibition and catalog that I'm just so excited as somebody who is teaching about um, Asian American art, but even you know beyond Asian American art, um, it's going to be such a, an important volume um, uh, for many reasons. So thank you, everyone, Margot, um, Luis, Theo, Patricia, and, and Mark. Thank you. Thank you again uh, so much. That was such a wonderful conversation. Uh, and so glad to see such a great audience that stuck around and all the great questions. And um, just wanted to close by highlighting if we could go to um, the oral history slide. The, um, another aspect of the his, uh, natural outgrowth of this exhibition catalog and collaborations is the Filipino American Oral History Project which we have launched a collaboration with the Clement Price Institute and the Newark Museum of Art. We are highlighting uh, the first, our first six participants in the Oral History Project are on view in the gallery and we'll be continuing to gather stories from anybody who wants to participate at our public programs and other, and other formats as, long as, as the project evolves. So stay tuned about that. And next slide, I think, actually that's the last slide, but did wanna say that we have a wonderful, um, our first public program is the Filipino American Community Te that will be on May, sorry, March 26th, all day long, free, wonderful events for everybody. And um, we hope to see you and welcome you to the exhibition whenever you can get here. I think that's the end. Have a wonderful program. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank Thanks you. so much. So, bye bye.